We're stepping into our January series, and I'm entitling this series, Reclaim. Reclaim means to do again. Claim, of course, means to take possession of. So reclaim means that we had it, but lost it, but we're taking possession of it again. And there are areas of our lives that we need to reclaim. And today I want to talk about reclaiming our mind reclaiming our mind and some of you are thinking I wish my neighbor was here because they've lost theirs right well maybe you need to reclaim some things in your mind can we pray together and just ask the Lord to bless this time of preaching of the word in Jesus name father we come before you today we love you thank you Lord for your hand that is upon us thank you Lord that we've gathered in your name and you've honored us once again with your awesome presence we are stepping into such an important topic under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Father, would you please give me strength to preach the word you place in my heart? And would you help us to understand what the Spirit is saying to us today? We pray that strongholds in our minds would be broken, that we would walk in greater liberty and purpose. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. There is in Great Britain a butterfly called the cabbage white butterfly. It's called so because of its affinity for cabbage leaves in its caterpillar stage. There is a very strange, almost sci-fi-like alien occurrence that happens to almost 60% of these butterflies at caterpillar stage. You see, they have a voracious appetite at the caterpillar stage, and as I mentioned, they love to eat the leaves of cabbages and also radishes. Radishes, And there are wasps. It's a certain kind of a wasp called the uh, Cotsia glomerata. The Cotsia glomerata. And as strange as it sounds, this wasp injects its eggs into the body of that white cabbage caterpillar. You guys are like, where are we going with this? <laughs> Hang on. These wasps can smell the saliva of a white cabbage caterpillar mixed with plant matter, and it's like a perfume to them. It attracts them and allows them to locate these caterpillars. And so these caterpillars are not defenseless. They're actually very fierce. They're very aggressive. They're bigger. They're stronger than the wasp. And the caterpillar attacks the wasp when it's trying to inject its eggs into the caterpillar's body. In fact, many times the caterpillar maims and even kills the wasp. But the wasp, in spite of the danger, perseveres. And if it's successful, it injects up to 50 eggs directly into the body of the caterpillar. Now, outwardly, the caterpillar appears completely normal after this strange episode. It feeds, it grows in typical fashion, but under the surface of its body, the wasp larvae are also growing. For two weeks, they feed on non-essential tissues of the caterpillar. But at two weeks, the wasp larvae appear or emerge. But before they do, they release a chemical that paralyzes the caterpillar and forever changes the nature of the white cabbage caterpillar. So they're slowly munching their way out with their sharp little teeth. And they're, in fact, the, the caterpillar skin is very tough, very thick. And we're talking about 50 larvae. Imagine what that looks like as they start to emerge out of this one caterpillar. Once the larvae wiggle their way almost all the way out, they begin to spin cocoons. And their cocoons overlap each other, so it looks like it's just one big cocoon. And incredibly, while this is all happening, the caterpillar is still alive. But the caterpillar is under the control of the chemicals of the wasp that was released into its body, and it literally rewires its brain, for lack of a better word, and the chemical of the wasp causes the caterpillar to become maternal or motherly towards the larva. 
Under normal circumstances, that caterpillar would not exhibit any maternal behavior whatsoever. But the caterpillar, which is supposed to spin a cocoon for itself and become a butterfly, instead uses its own silk to reinforce the cocoons for the wasps, larvae. It fiercely watches over and defends the cocoon and protects the wasps and continues to do this until it starves to death. Happy Sunday. I needed a good story to get started this year because I knew it wasn't just going to be any old intro that was going to capture the hearts of our people. We've, we've gone through so much, but I have your attention now. And this is a perfect illustration of how the enemy works in our lives. He injects what I would like to call toxic thoughts into our minds. And he hijacks or rewires us. He hijacks our purpose and we become a host for the enemy. And instead of feeding ourselves and maturing, we become a host for those toxic thoughts, and they feed on us. And we let those thoughts mature into actions. We allow those thoughts to mature into behaviors that we ultimately begin to nurture and to protect. Those thoughts, those toxic thoughts, turn into behaviors, and, and when people try to confront the behavior. When people try to confront the attitudes, we, we become defensive and we protect the very thing that is stealing away our spiritual life and purpose. And we can ultimately die with our purpose unfulfilled. We die never having truly spread our wings and experiencing the lofty purposes of God for our life because an alien species injected us with toxic thoughts and put us under his spell. I want to ask you a question. Do you have thoughts that are holding you back? Are there behaviors that you really thought you could put away or wanted to put away over the new year, but they're already reemerging in your life? We know that the mind is a battlefield. And most of life's battles are won or lost in the mind. But I have good news for you, and the good news is that God's word is powerful, and it can rescue us, and we can be renewed in our minds, and we can defeat the toxic thoughts that are prevalent. The devil is fighting you in your mind, church. That's where the battle's at. I want you to think about Eve and the serpent in the Garden of Eden for a moment. And certainly it was a battle of the mind. It was a battle for the control of thoughts. And the devil attacked what Eve already knew to be true. She knew the boundary. She knew that she was not supposed to eat that forbidden fruit. She knew that the God had spoken and had created a fence line and had put a prohibition on the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the devil began to relentlessly attack that divine knowledge. And he started by saying, well, did God, did he really say that? Well, yes, that's what he said. Well, did he mean that? Well, I think that's what he meant. Well, are you sure that God's not just trying to rob you of something? Are you sure that he doesn't just want you to be a God like him? Because if you eat it, you'll probably just be like God. You'll have knowledge of good and evil, and that puts you on the level of God. And he just started to attack what was true in her mind. And we know the story that she ate the fruit, and as a result, she lost, she and her husband, Adam, lost the provision in place that their heavenly father had designed for them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 4, the Bible says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. That's not really where the battle's at. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It's not fleshly, but, but mighty in God for pulling down or demolishing, demolishing, I should say, strongholds. That's what it's really all about. The, God gives us power 
to demolish strongholds. Now, the word stronghold means a military fortress. Think big, thick walls that are almost impenetrable. The devil creates strongholds in your mind, and he can hold you prisoner there. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've lived that. And there has been a, a lie that the enemy has sold you and you operated your life with that false knowledge. And it had a, a restricting and binding impact on your life. Verse 5, Paul continues to say, casting down arguments. So the, the, we are mighty in God for what purpose? For pulling down strongholds and for casting down arguments. Who's arguing? Well, the enemy. The enemy begins to argue against what is true. He begins to attack the knowledge, the divine knowledge that you have through the word of God. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's a powerful statement. Bringing thoughts Captive, making thoughts captive. Rather than you being captive to the thought, you make the thought captive. And you determine what you're going to believe. And you determine what is true based on the word of God and the power of God. The enemy builds one toxic thought after another and creates a wall between you and the liberty and the purpose of God. And he continues to lie until you are a prisoner of his deception. And you start to believe it. He whispers in your ear and he tells you, you simply can't trust people. You just can't trust people. Why is he saying that? So he can isolate you. It's easier for him to destroy you when you are alone. You're never going to succeed at anything that you try. You, you will never have a prayer life. How many times have you tried to have a prayer life? You're never going to have a prayer life. It's prayer week. And, and you might as well not even get started because you're not going to last. And this prayer thing is beyond you. Reading the Word and having a relationship with the Word of God. You can't understand the Bible. When you read it, you don't understand it. So why even bother reading it? And so the enemy lies to you. But at the same time, he tells you that you can be successful in the world. And he wants to push you out there and he pushes you to, to succeed or, or, or to rise when it comes to recreation or, or to be really good at something that you enjoy doing that doesn't have anything to do with God. So, so you're a mountain climber in some aspects of your life, but when it comes to your walk with God, oh, you can't do that. Why even try? You're going to fail at whatever you try to do as it relates to God. With God's help, we can demolish strongholds. And instead of being a host, or rather than being a captive of those toxic thoughts devised by the devil, you can take those toxic thoughts captive. And let us remember that the devil is not the only one who lies to us. We lie to ourselves. The writer James in 121 says, that we can deceive our own selves. Yes, you, you can deceive yourself. And, and how many times have people done that? And how many times do we hear people saying that? Well, I'm never going to drink again. Or I'm never going to smoke that again. Or I'm never going to go there again. That's never going to happen in my life. And my parents were divorced, but uh, I, I'm not going to go down that road. And, 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 and my, my, my father abused me, but, but uh, this guy who has a violent history is never going to abuse me. And people lie to themselves. Yes, we can lie to ourselves. The enemy accuses us. And we can accuse ourselves. And, 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 and we make the mistake of in our own reasoning. We, become, we, we fall prey to that toxic default in our own reasoning. And we come to wrong conclusions. And, and we lie to ourselves. If you're a note taker, I want you to write this down. Our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. 
And so as a result, our behavior, our ethics, our character, our level of consecration are all a reflection of our thought life. That's true for every person in this room. Whether you're on a spiritual winning streak or you're in a spiritual tailspin, I'm here to declare to you that you are where you are and you are what you are because of the dominating thoughts that dominate your life. Now we need to think about this. I want you to take inventory of your thought life. Are your thoughts driven by fear? Or are your thoughts driven by faith? When you focus... And when you speak and when you talk in your conversations, do you focus on what could go wrong? Do you focus on what is wrong in the world? What is wrong in your life or everybody else's life? Or do you focus on the power of God and the purpose of God that is operating in your life and in this world? I want you to ask yourself that question. Do your thoughts gravitate towards faith? Do your thoughts gravitate towards fear? Do you concede easily? Do you persevere in spite of adversity? Do you focus on the wind and the waves of life? Or do you focus on the one who's walking on the water? Where is your focus? Well, that's evidenced by what comes out of your mouth. How you talk. Yes. Do you think about temporary things or do you think about eternal things? Where are you on the scale of your thought life? Are you obsessed with what you look like and what you wear and, and, and how many people liked your last social media post? Is that what you're focused on and what's going to happen this weekend? And, and, and the Packers score is more important to you than, than, than what I'm saying to you right now? Or are you obsessed with eternity, with what your soul looks like, and how you can get God to hit the like button on your life? Your thoughts are like a tire that's out of alignment. Anybody ever drive with a tire out of alignment? And you're just fighting that car because it wants to go this way. It wants to go that way, and you're always just trying to correct it. Well, our thoughts are like that. Negative thinkers, always negative. The tire's out of alignment. It's pulling you into this ditch. Life is bad. The world is bad. It's never going to happen. I can't do it. It's impossible. I'm never going to catch a break. Everyone else gets blessed. I don't get blessed. And it's this negative thinking and it pulls them that way. But then there are other people who they think positively. And, and, and no matter what they go through, God is good. All things are possible. God's going to work it out. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, all things are working together for good. I'm called according to his purpose. No takers, write this down. Your life is pulled in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Make sure you write that down. That is so important. I'm not good enough. My past is too bad. I've made too many mistakes. There's no way that I can live a normal life. There's no way that I can be normal. I've been exposed to too much. I've, I've gone through too much. And, and I'm just never going to, to live a victorious or over, overcoming life. I'm going to be defined by my wounds. I'm not defined by the cross. I'll never be able to be faithful with my money. I'll, I, I, I need someone in my life, no matter what it costs me. No matter the consequence, no matter how messed up that person is, I just need somebody in my life. These are, these are the lies, the toxic thoughts that we can operate our life with. I'll never have the God connection that I'm supposed to have. And those, those thoughts... The dominating thoughts pull your life in that direction. You'll remember that last year we had Tracy Lewis with us. 
a crisis counselor and he's writing a book and he talked to us about the fact that the brain is like plastic, that it can change form and shape. It's called neuroplasticity. The brain has the ability to change. And he was talking about neuropathways. And neuropathways make it easier and easier to think a thought. He talked about synaptic connections that get stronger and stronger and essentially creates a deep neuro groove in your brain that fast tracks certain thoughts. And we've all seen it. And something absolutely amazing happens, but there's a person who has that negative thought pattern, and they come out with something totally negative about a totally good thing. And you just like step back, and you're like, how did you do that? I mean, that took a lot of ability to, to turn that into negative. What is it? It's, it's the groove. It's the neuro pathway. It's a stronghold. It's a rut. Yeah, that we create neuro pathways in our in our brains, in our physical brains. The more we think something, the easier it is to go in that direction of our thinking. And so, yes, that's biblically what a stronghold is. It it creates a rut of thinking. We have snow in Wisconsin right now, and it's and it's easier to walk in the snow that you've walked before. In a path that you've walked before. The, hard, the first time is the hardest time, but every time you walk that path in the snow, it gets a little bit easier. And the same is true for our mind. And so I just want to tell you, there's a sign, I believe it's in Alaska, and their roads are really rough. And there's a sign in Alaska, in this really, really difficult road, treacherous road. It does, it's just basically a, a mud and it says at the beginning of the, of the road, it says, choose your rut carefully. You're going to be in it for 50 miles. And I'd like to preach that to ATC this morning. And I'd like to say, choose your rut carefully. You're going to be in it for a while. And you know what? I don't want to have negative strongholds. I want to have positive strongholds. I want to create pathways in my mind of faith. I want to create pathways in my mind of truth. Amen. So we need to identify the, tax, the, excuse me, the toxic thoughts that we have. I want to ask you a question. What toxic thought is holding you hostage? What toxic thought is really disfiguring your life? Where do you have your wires crossed? We need to talk about this because you can't defeat what you don't define. Take inventory of your life. What is the thing you most dislike about your behavior? That is a sincere question. I want you to think about that. What is the thing that you most dislike about your behavior? Now I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them, no, don't do that. What is the thought now that is driving that behavior? Because that behavior is the result of thoughts. That behavior is the result of a stronghold. This behavior has a, well, it, it, it has a genesis. It had a genesis as thoughts, and then it grew and it matured in your life. And now it's become action. It's become behavior. What is the thought that is driving that behavior? Note takers, write this down. For every stronghold in your life, there is a truth that will demolish it. Because truth is greater than the lie. And light is greater than darkness. In John chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus said, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. For every stronghold in your life, there is a truth that will demolish it. Again, 2 Corinthians 10 and 5, casting down arguments. That word casting down means to forcibly yank down with authority. To forcibly yank it down. Arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity. And that means to lead or to bring under control to the obedience of Christ. 
For every stronghold in your life, there is a truth that will demolish it. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 tells us, and do not be conformed to this world. And that will preach all day long by itself. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach all day long, but that's a good word. We've got to stop trying to be like everybody else. We've got to stop trying to live like everybody else. Come on now. There is a stampede to hell. There are people who are godless and irreligious and profane. And our world is distracted. Our world is just absolutely losing touch with reality. But I'm so thankful the Bible tells me don't be like the world. Don't be conformed to the world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I'm so glad there's an option. I'm so glad that there is another option than just doing what the world does and going where the world's going. Don't be conform but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God we're supposed to be transformed how by the renewing of our mind okay we've talked given we've given a little bit of an ought to let's talk about the how to how do we renew our mind Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 Paul says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Everybody say meditate. The general idea of meditating is to focus one's thoughts. Focus your thought on these things things. The Greek word here means to take into account. Take it into account. Philippians 4.8 is talking about God's word, I believe, and truth, because God's word is true, and God's word is noble, and God's word is just, and God's word is pure. It is lovely. Amen? It's good news. It's a good report. And Psalm 119 verse 15 tells us, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. Take the word into account. How do we renew our minds? Take the word into account. This is how we deprogram toxic thoughts. This is how you forcibly yank down and lead your thought life with truth instead of being led by lies. Somebody needs to hear what I'm saying today because there are a lot of voices in this generation who are speaking to us. And they're telling us there's no hope. Yes, we have, we have a, a, a politicians who are saying, you know what, we just need to learn to live like this. You know, and, and, and media is trying to scare us half to death. And everybody's reading, well, you should do this. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Well, if you really, if you really, you know, you really need to do this in order to protect yourself. No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Everybody's lying. They're all lying to you. Don't, don't do that. Don't do this. Everybody's lying to you. And it doesn't matter which side of the pandemic you're on. Everybody's lying to you. Where is truth? Where do we begin? How do we get on with life? How do we get on with being a church in this generation that's telling us nothing's ever going to change? It's, always gonna get, it's only going to get worse. And, and we don't have any answers. And, and here's the medication. This will get the job done. No, it won't get the job done. You need a booster. Oh, you need another booster. That's, that's really going to get the job done. If you wear this, that'll get the job done. And I'm not against anything that I'm talking about right now. But I'm just telling you, you've got to choose what you're going to focus on in this generation. And I'm here to tell you, oh, I feel like preaching in the Holy Ghost for a second. I'm here to tell somebody, you need to bring every thought into captivity, and you need to say what Paul said. I'm not determined to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'm so glad that the sun rose this morning and I know that Jesus is on the throne and he's given me grace and power and strength for the journey. Somebody said amen. I just about 
preached myself into a coughing fit right there and scared the whole church. <laughs> Where's that picture frame at? Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. I've got a phone. Do I have a phone? Yes, I do. Okay. I used somebody else's phone in the first service, and then I dropped it. <clears throat> it's okay. It was my son's. He has to forgive me. You have to choose how you're going to frame your life. What's the lens that you're going to look through in your life? And I think that some people, what they want to focus on and frame is, is all of this confusion in our world. And, and they focus on, on the pandemic, and they focus on distrust, and they focus on disagreement, and they're focusing on governmental issues and political issues, and, and who's, you know, who's going to run? For president next time, and I'm glad you know, Tim. Who's it going to be? How are we going to live our life? And there are some people, literally, this is, this is what their life looks like. Life is bad. Life is dark. It's horrible out there. Life is bleak. And you know what? They've got this hypothesis that life is dark and bleak. And you know what they do? Instead of reading the Bible, they read the paper. Instead of reading the Bible, they get on their websites to talk about how everybody's lying to them. And I got some church folks who are more concerned about the fact that the government's lying to you than realizing that there's a spiritual lie that you can operate with. And more than that, the lie is not greater than the truth that God has given to us. And we can know the truth and the truth will make us free. You're going to have to choose what you're going to focus on. You're going to have to choose what you're going to frame in your life and how you're going to live your life. This is how I want to live my life. I want to live my life and say, you know what? Jesus is the light of the world. I see a horizon. I see hope. If the world doesn't change, my world's going to change. Because one day I shall be changed. One day I shall behold him. One day I'm going to walk on streets of gold. One day I'm going to be in a place where there are no, no more tears and, and no more fear and no more pandemic. Come on, somebody, I'm trying to help you and tell you, you need to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and his goodness. Bring that thought into captivity. Bring down every imagination. Just jerk it down and say, as long as I know there's a Savior, as long as I know that there's grace for me today, I'm going to wake up and say, Lord, you have purpose for me today. You have a plan for my life today. If you believe that, say amen. You may be seated. Confront the stronghold. Declare war on those toxic thoughts. Stop being a host. You know, that caterpillar looked normal for a while. Going away, munching on leaves, doing its thing. But under its skin, something sinister was at work. That's crazy. Just before they emerge from that caterpillar, they release a toxin that paralyzes the caterpillar. And that toxin also causes them, causes the caterpillar to change the way it lives its life and its, its whole purpose. Caterpillars are supposed to become butterflies. But the caterpillar's now protecting the alien host. Folks, we need to get this into our spirit. The devil is working just like that in this generation. And we've got to get this in our spirit. Somebody said amen. amen. Hallelujah. So do me a favor. Stop sending me emails about how bad the world is. Stop sending me emails about how, how everybody's lying. Would you stop doing that? And would you do this preacher a favor? Would you let me know that you are, are framing the word of God? And while there are lies that are operating in our world, and I'm sure there are, and I'm assuming that there are because this is a fallen world, the greater truth is this. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There is hope in a lying world. There is hope in a pandemic-fueled world. There is hope for people who are in despair. His name is Jesus. And when all you can talk about is the lies, the devil has hijacked your purpose. He's hijacked your purpose. Amen. We need to declare war on the strongholds. Note takers, write this down. Practically, how can I do this? Number one, identify the toxic thought. Identify the toxic thought that is behind the behavior in your life that you know is your number one. Thing that needs to change. Write it down. This is the toxic lie that I continue to believe. This is the toxic lie in my life that is holding me captive. And let's just assume that your toxic thought is low self worth. Let's just go with that so we can illustrate this. So what you would do is you would say, well, the toxic lie in my life that is holding me captive is that I'm not good enough. I have an internalized sense of disgrace about myself. That's number one. Identify your toxic thought. This is the toxic lie that I continue to believe. Number two, identify what this toxic thought is doing to your life. So write that down. Low self-worth has affected my relationship with my friends, my spouse, my family. Low self-worth affects the way that I view God. I struggle to pray because I doubt that he cares. I doubt his grace and I struggle with condemnation. I keep my church family and spiritual authority at a safe distance. Low self-worth has paralyzed me from walking by faith and considering or even pursuing what God has called me to do. Number two, identify what that toxic thought is doing to your life. Number three, forecast what will happen if you don't confront the toxic thought. Forecast it. If I don't confront this toxic thought, this lie, I will become isolated from my God, my loved ones, my church family, and it will make it easier for the enemy to destroy my life, and I will never live my God purpose. Forecast what will happen if you don't confront the toxic lie. Number four, forecast what will happen if you do confront the toxic thought. If I confront this toxic thought, I will enjoy or experience the joy of the Lord. I will feel the strength of the body of Christ. I will begin my journey of answering my true call, and I will live my purpose. Forecast what will happen if you do confront the toxic thought. And finally, not finally, I've got another one after this. This is the truth that demolishes the toxic lie. That's the next thing. Number five, this is the truth. Here's the lie. Here's the truth that will demolish the lie. If it's low self-esteem, well, I think one of the powerful truths is that God loves me. And he said, whosoever will, let him come. And that includes me. Whosoever includes me. Another truth would be I was born again of the water and of the spirit. So I am family. And I do have a place at the table. I do belong in the body of Christ because I am part of the body of Christ. I was born into this thing. God has ascribed a worth to my life and that he died for me. So here I am with living with this lie of low self-worth. When God has ascribed the greatest worth to my life and that he paid the greatest price that has ever been paid. 
to possess something, the sinless blood of Jesus Christ. This is the truth. While I was a sinner, while I was at my worst, Christ died for me. So this is the truth, that God's grace is real. His love isn't just some idea, it's mine. And although I'm imperfect, I am complete in him because that's what the Bible says. So identify the toxic thought. Identify what it is doing to your life. Forecast what will happen if you don't confront that lie. Forecast what will happen if you do confront the lie. And then that truth. What is the truth? Speak to the truth. Reveal the truth that will demolish the toxic lie. And then finally, make a declaration statement about the whole thing. Make a declaration statement and write it down. So if you have low self-worth, go through the exercise that I've shared with you and then write your declaration statement from your own heart. I am a child of God. I am loved fully by him. I am washed in his precious blood. I am filled with his spirit. I am his child. I am called according to his purpose. When I walk in the spirit, I will not fulfill the lust of my flesh. He is my father. He is leading me. If he takes me to it, he'll take me through it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And write your declaration statement. What are we talking about? We're talking about building a righteous stronghold. Now you have traded strongholds. Now you have traded the lie and you've pulled it down and you've demolished it with the truth of God's word and now you're living your whole life on a different premise, the premise of truth. Do you understand how powerful it is? Do you realize that you don't have to be a pawn? You don't have to be a host to the enemy? You don't have to live a hijacked life? You can live your purpose. <laughs> Hallelujah. I would just dearly wish that somebody would believe what I'm preaching today as the musicians come. God has provided us with his word and we can use this right knowledge and through repetition and meditation on that information that he has so wonderfully created for us, we can have a redeeming stronghold that we can live our life with. When wrong information comes into our life, the redeeming stronghold will resist and prevail against anything that is against the knowledge of God. Do you have a stronghold in your mind? What is the behavior that you, that's just, I had this the whole time. I forgot. This whole time I've just been wishing upon a star that I had brought my handkerchief. False knowledge. You see that? That's a powerful illustration, right? I wish I had it. You do have it, dummy. Oh, man. God has provided us with right knowledge. And we can have powerful strongholds that will bless us and keep us secure. I'll always be addicted. I'll always be an alcoholic. I'll always have a bad temper. I'll never get a job. I'll always be in debt. I'll never amount to anything. Stop being a host to the enemy. Stop being separated from the provisions of your heavenly father. Would you stand with me? I want you to reclaim your mind. And I want you to reclaim your mind by identifying the behavior that you don't like about your life. And get down to the thought. And then confront that thought. Yank it down by considering the greater truth, the truth that trumps the lie in your life. Brothers and sisters, until we do this, the enemy's going to have a stronghold in your life. And no amount of time in church is going to change your situation.
can hear a thousand sermons and lessons, but unless you form new strongholds, redeeming and righteous strongholds, you will be separated from the provision that God wants to deliver into your life. Lord Jesus, help us today. There's so many distractions. The, the wind and the waves of this generation are raging. And if we're not careful, we're going to focus on the wrong thing, the wind and the waves, and at the expense of who's walking on the water towards us and calling us to come and to be with you. Jesus, we need a revival in our own lives before we can have a revival in this nation. Judgment begins at the house of the Lord. Hallelujah, Lord, we open our hearts to you. We are an open book. Speak to us, Jesus. Give us wisdom, I pray. There's an altar. This is our altar area here. This is what we call our altar. And we invite our church family to come. If God is speaking to you, I want to invite you to come and just have some time to pray. Don't worry about who's next to you. This is just you and God. And I want you to give a voice to the Lord. I want you to invite him to begin to search your heart. Let him speak to you. Identify the stronghold. Let's take authority over fear. Let's transition our life to faith. Right now, you can become a child of God. You can repent of your sin. You can come to this altar or where you're standing right now and you can say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me, Lord, for the wrong thoughts and the wrong attitudes and the wrong behaviors. I'm sorry, God. I confess it to you. I don't want to live that way anymore. You can invite God to fill you with His Spirit. And He will. He'll fill you with His Spirit. He'll place His anointing upon your life. You can be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We have water today. And God will put your sin into remission. Hallelujah. You can be born again today. Yes, yes, yes. God's greatest gifts are available to you right now. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's right. Search Him. Call on His name. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Born, but he won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Cause my God will never fail. No, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Yes, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Yes, I know. 